Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. As always, on the fourth Wednesday of the month, I'm joined by Mark Labar, conservation biologist for Audubon, Vermont. Great to see you again. Always great to be here. It uh, looks like today we're going to catch up on some viewer mail. Yeah, we'll try. You know, it's great. Folks often email me, send me letters uh, about the show. We always say that at the end. Uh, you know, if you have questions, give me a call. And so I'm trying to catch up. I kind of get a stockpile and then uh, we try to, you know, dedicate a show to getting to some of them. All right, well, let's start off with Rose Crossley. Now, she says, hi, folks. I'm pretty good at identifying birds, but this one has me stymied. I'm wondering if anybody knows for certain what bird this is in the attached photograph. They showed up at the feeding station this past weekend. At first, I thought it might be a snow bunting because of all the white, but the markings don't look like a snow bunting. It's not only that, but it was a single bird. So this is really interesting, and we've touched on this before. This is actually a junco. Really? which is a common feeder bird, but it's a leucistic junco. Okay. So uh, leucisticism is um, when pigment, pigment is not developed in the bird, and, and so they show these white patches. Uh, it is different from albinoism in that albino, and, uh, albinoism usually shows you actually have a pink eye mm -hmm. that goes with that with other animals as well as birds. And as far as birds, Birds with albinoism usually don't survive all that well, primarily because their sight is reduced. So okay. um, we often get lots of different images uh, that we see. People report these leucistic things. It throws people off. Mm -hmm. You know, they're good birders, and they see this bird, and it's not the right plumage, uh, but it has that same shape and um, it and might look be to it. Hanging out with similar birds, but right. look totally different. Exactly. There probably were other juncos there, so mm -hmm. it wasn't really alone. Um, and, you know, we see this across the spectrum of birds. Uh, I have a couple more shots that were in my files, and I, I apologize, I, I couldn't match up who, who sent them. Uh, but uh, this is now a leucistic black-capped chickadee at a feeder. Look at that. So you can see it's got that white head. It still looks like a chickadee. It's got some pigment left over, you know, so it picks up here and there. Interesting. Um, I, interestingly enough, yellow is usually one of the pigments that um, remains in hmm. birds when they get leucisticism. So uh, this is a great shot that somebody sent in. And this other shot is another example of even in larger birds. Here's a red-tailed hawk that's leucistic. And, and you can see it's almost all white there. It's like an owl. Yeah, it stands out. And oftentimes, you know, um, albinoism, leucisticism can be detrimental to organisms because they stand out. Mm -hmm. um, right. And other predators can then pick them out and see them easier. Uh, something like this red-tailed hawk probably doesn't have to worry about it. <laughs> no. And even some of the smaller birds don't really have to worry about it. But it's a cool abnormality that we see in the bird world. And uh, it's, I would say it's uncommon, but uh, you don't see it every day. Yeah. All right, here's another um, letter. Hello, I'm, I'm hoping Mark Labar can help me identify this huge, beautiful bird that's been hanging around our house in Westford. It's been on our roof and in a large elm tree since Tuesday. I'm hoping it's an eagle. I always enjoy your show and info that you share. Thanks. Dana Wagner. So this is a bald eagle. Really? Yes, it's an immature bald eagle. Yep. Um, I was traveling around yesterday down in West Haven, Vermont, and we saw an adult which had the classic white head and white table tail. But this guy is, you know, pretty much brown. It looks like it's probably it's big a, yellow feet. Too. Yeah, big a first year bird maybe. Mm -hmm. um, they pick up more and more color as time passes, and it takes them about four years to get that full classic bald eagle look. Mm -hmm. uh, but this certainly is a large bird. A bald yeah. eagles. When any they're... concern about it hanging around the house? No, no, you know, it's it's probably, you know, there was a, earlier this month, there were about 25 to 30 eagles that were seen up on Lake Champlain mm -hmm. off the Georgia shore that were feeding, and these birds are just taking advantage of um, feeding opportunities and roosting opportunities, so that bird was there for a reason, not exactly sure why, but <laughs> hopefully it found um, what it was looking for. Okay. And I think I am up with the next um, uh, letter, and this comes from uh, John Michelucci, or Michael Lucci. Um, he writes, uh, he's from Plattsburgh, New York, and he writes, we recently have seen these hawks around our backyard bird feeders. From my investigation on the internet, maybe Cooper hawks, Cooper's hawks. They hang out around our hedges in the backyard, and one of them was sitting on the roof of a storage shed, then flew into hedge to get something. So this is a Cooper's hawk. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a young Cooper's hawk, and the way you can tell, oftentimes um, you can see the bands on the tail of this bird. See yeah. how they're kind of 
a regular. Mm -hmm. They're not a straight line across. Yep. And that is uh, indicative of, of Cooper's hawks. Um, they are birds that will come in and they'll hang around feeders. Here's another uh, shot. You can see that um, uneven tail um, stripe that goes across it. This is uh, probably a young bird. Uh, and uh, again, they come into feeders. Oftentimes, folks don't get a chance to see these birds all that much because they're often tucked in and... Yeah, and it's hard to point him out. Right, and this guy just happened to be hanging around and uh, maybe looking for voles or even um, other birds at the feeder system. Now there's a hawk that looks very similar to this Correct. one, which just always stumps me. Right, and, and it's a tough one oftentimes when these birds are coming through. Uh, this is a sharp-shinned hawk. Uh, you can see again, looking at that tail feathers, that has a nice yeah. crisp kind of line that goes all the way across. And also you can see that the bottom edge of the tail is, is square. Mm -hmm. uh, Cooper's hawk has a rounded bottom. Okay. Um, and I always kind of think of it as that round looks like a C, so C for Cooper's. Got it. Um, again, both occipiters, woodland hawks. Mm -hmm. um, they use that long tail and short wings to navigate through the woods. Again, often feeding on, on small songbirds. Okay, great. Uh, here's a letter from Bobby Sleeper from Montpelier. She says, I live in Montpelier, and although I have never had a bird feeder until this year, I've always had lots of winter birds, chickadees, crows, cardinals, etc. This year I have seen no birds. Why is that? Can you explain that? Um, well, let, you know, we can go right back to those previous pictures of the, uh, the Cooper's hawks mm -hmm. and the Sharpshins hawks. Again, they will often come in, and we've talked about this when we talk about uh, bird feeding. Uh, they'll often come in, they'll sit quietly off to the side. You won't necessarily see them, but All they, of a sudden, there's, there's, there's it's no quiet. <laughs> right, right, because the birds know that those hawks are there, mm -hmm. and they become potential prey. Uh, so both the Coopers and the Sharpie can do that, the Sharpshind. And so that may be one reason that she uh, doesn't have the birds. I haven't heard back from her to mm -hmm. see whether uh, the birds have come back. Sometimes the hawks will leave and move, and right. so your feeders will be full again. Uh, but I'm not exactly sure if that was the case in, in her um, situation. Okay. Uh, I have an image here uh, and an email. This is the best of two pics I took in my front yard. It flew out in front of my car and it lit on the tree and stayed long enough for me to get the camera after and take a second pick. And then after the second pick, it flew off, I'm sorry. Um, he thought it was a sawwood owl. And this to me looks like a screech owl. <laughs> okay, this, eyes. yes, and so this is a great little owl. They're not very big. Um, Sawwets are a little bit smaller than this, uh, but screech owls um, oftentimes will let you get fairly close to them. Hmm. Um, they have a very eerie owl call. People have said it is reminiscent of like a, a, a screaming woman or a, a, her, a you know, horse neighing backwards and um, something like that. So they're a bird, they're an owl that we would see around in in Vermont, uh, and one that you know it can often be seen a little bit more so than some of the um, some of the other owls. Wow! You know? All right. Well, what else are folks seeing this time of year? Well, there's been a recent influx of uh, bohemian waxwings. Mm -hmm. um, there for a while, uh, you know, I was watching, we haven't seen any at the Audubon, but I was watching the, um, you know, the listserv, and all of a sudden the bohemian waxwings started showing up. Uh, bohemian waxwings are like our cedar waxwings, uh, but we usually normally see them in the wintertime. And the way you can tell is they're a little bit stockier, but those, you, you see those red undertail mm -hmm. coverts there, those feathers on the undertail? That's a great sign of uh, a bohemian waxing wing, if you can see that. They're often associated with um, cedar wax wings, uh, and this time of year they're often seen uh, in your crab apples or your berry bushes uh, feeding on berries. So this is a cedar wax wing, and you can see if you again look at that uh, undertail feathers, there's no red. Right. And so that tells us that this bird um, is a cedar wax wing, and you'll often see them together in large numbers. Uh, they'll come in, They'll eat you out of house and home and <laughs> strip your trees down and then they move on to the next wing. But, um, you know, a great bird for this kind, this time of year for a lot of birders. And like I said, once they started coming in, you know, the internet just was like, I've got them here, I've got yeah, them here. I, yeah, they're you great birds, them. they're great birds to see. What about Lake Champlain? You know, it's been such an unusual winter. It has been, uh, you know, last month we talked about our eagle surveys and we had good numbers for eagles. Uh, we still are getting reports of eagles all over uh, the lake, uh, but it's gotten a little bit colder. Uh, you know, we had that cold snap earlier in the month. And so um, what that does is it, in certain areas where you see a lot of waterfowl, it often concentrates them. So 
uh, birders get a chance to see them a little bit better. They're not as dispersed and they're out there in large flocks. So there's been a couple of uh, good ones out there. Uh, this is a redheaded duck or redhead, um, as it, it gets its name, obviously, from that nice um, bright beautiful. redhead. So that's a beautiful waterfowl out there. And oftentimes these birds are also in, you know, uh, they're in their breeding plumage at this point in time. They're, oh, okay. they're starting the whole process. A really great duck that was seen, this is down, all, all these were seen down at the Champlain Bridge, um, is a tufted duck. Now this is a good one for birders. Again, you know, waterfowl can, yes, <laughs> can be very, yeah, spectacular. And and this is a great bird because it's not often seen here, but uh, again, picked up down in Lake Champlain, right uh, near the Champlain Bridge. And then um, another duck that is uh, often seen down there is called a ringneck duck. And uh, it's an interesting bird because I always wonder why, you know, there, there is some plumage characteristics that have a ring on it, but uh, this is again another striking um, waterfowl, uh, you know, that a lot of them are, are in their breeding plumage. And you may even see, I was down at Shelburne Bay not too long ago at the bottom end of Shelburne Bay. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of bufflehead and, and other ducks out there that were actually displaying, you know, oh, starting really? to do their, you know, they do some is funky that early head tilts. No, no, that's just about on time. You know, okay. they're, they're just starting to get, they're just ramping up, I guess. Um, all right, what other birds do we see this time of year? Well, I have one birder I know, Bruce McPherson, who's um, uh, with the Green Mountain Audubon Society, uh, mm -hmm. does a lot of birding, uh, and he pulled in a northern shrike up in Grand Isle. Uh, now, this is a, it's a passerine, so it's a, considered a songbird, uh, but it is also known as the butcher bird. Uh, we that beak. Yeah, so that beak, you can see that sharp hook mm -hmm. on that, and this bird will uh, take its prey, and that could be crickets, it could be frogs, and it'll oftentimes impale that on a hawthorn tree or even barbed wire. Hence really? its name, the butcher bird. Uh, it kind of, you know, uses that as a means of, uh, you know, providing food for a mate as well as stockpile. So it's, it's a cool little bird. I banded these before late in the season, um, and uh, they can put uh, holes in your fingers. I they're would they're that little bill when it grabs on. It's like a, it's like a little uh, paper punch there. So uh, yes, they can be they can be quite. Uh, in fact, the last time I banded one, everybody walked up to the net. You know, we use nets to catch the birds, mm -hmm. and everybody kind of stepped back and we all looked <laughs> at who was going to go and take the bird out of the net. It was me and to I had a, I, I had a I had a <laughs> sore finger. Yes, yes. All right, we've got another letter here. Um, from Connie. She says, my 11-year-old daughter Abigail took this photo this morning. We we're wondering if it was a purple finch. If not, could you please tell us what it is? She's very proud of the photo. It's, and it's a great shot. It uh, is a very pretty yeah, shot. Yeah, and that's, you know, it is a purple finch. It's a great bird. The only other bird that we might confuse that with is a house finch, which has less of that uh, purple color. It has less, um, you know, it's a little redder um, in different places. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is a great bird. Uh, we had them come into our feeders early on this year yeah. and but people have been seeing them and it's a uh, it's a nice little bright red thing to liven up your day all right we also have one last um, letter from Louise she said it just uh, had a flock of close to 50 robins foraging in the grass and going up our wooded slope and I've seen a lot of robins too recently just suddenly yeah and, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that the snow is gone unfortunately for many people but mm -hmm. down low you know I was traveling through the Champlain Valley and there was very little snow after the weather we had earlier this month you know that it got cold and then we had that slug of rain um, and that warm temperature so robins are taking advantage of that uh, they can access and forage on the ground and so people are seeing them uh, quite a bit um, like I said I was traveling down towards West Haven and had a whole a number of flocks go up you know, in front of us as we drove along some of the back roads there. Are people concerned that there might not be enough for them no, to eat? No, they're fine. Don't worry about it. Yeah, <laughs> birds, are, birds are great, you know, and they can fly. You know? So yes. if the snow comes back in and they need to move a little bit further south, they're going to they're gonna do that. Uh, but robins are pretty hardy birds, right in there with our fav your favorite, the bluebirds. Mm -hmm. you know, they'll stick around if there's a food supply, just like the cedar waxwings and bohemian waxwings will take advantage of uh, those fruit supplies, so will robins. Since you mentioned the bluebirds, when should I put out my bluebird? My bluebird house uh, uh, if you can get dig into the ground yeah. or if you have a post I would get it out pr pretty soon usually they start coming back in April so you know if you get it out late February March make sure it's clean okay. um, you should be all set and ready for them to to come back or they may be already here they just might be come around to your house all right
Thank you. You're welcome. If you have a bird-related question, please pass it along to Mark. You can write to him at Audubon, Vermont, 255 Sherman Hollow Road in Huntington. The zip code is 05462. You can also email your question to Mark. His email address is mlabar at audubon.org. Send Mark your questions and he'll try to find answers for you on an upcoming edition of Bird Notes and also include photographs if you have them. Yes, yeah, yeah, they're great. They're always great. So thanks to viewers for sending that stuff in. All right. Thank you very much. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. We'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.